IPA for bringing me back to Ottawa. I'm thrilled to be back here again to talk to you all. And hello, producers. Producers, are you ready for a completely new ecosystem? Uh, because it's coming. It's coming for you. I want to begin with this observation, folks, that TV doesn't make any sense. I don't mean the programming. Actually, I like SpongeBob. I think it's fine. Uh, the, the thing I'm referring to is the business model in the ecosystem of TV that we currently have doesn't make any sense. No sane person would create this from scratch. And think about it, in the future, your grandchildren, my grandchildren, they're gonna look at me and they're gonna say, Grandpa or Grandma, is it really true that there was a time where the whole country had to sit down in front of a TV at the exact same minute to watch a show? But if you still get broadcast TV, that's, that hasn't changed in 60 years. And, and just when the show gets good, it gets interrupted with a commercial, actually a whole bunch of commercials. And that's not all. If you like that show and you want to watch another episode, you have to wait a whole week to get another episode. And if you want to watch it again, well, then you have to wait till the next season. So six months goes by before you get to see a repeat of the show that you liked. It doesn't make any sense in this day and age. And we set aside huge chunks of scarce radio frequency spectrum for broadcasting. It could be used for many other types of data services. When in the United States, only 10% of the people are actually watching television that way. It seems like such a waste of spectrum. Most of us are paying for pay TV, and most of us feel like we're paying too much money for way too many channels, more channels than we could possibly ever watch. But strangely, in the United States, even though we have all those channels, we still can't find room for one particular channel. <laughs> and we use this clunky interface to try to navigate through it, this grid-based system that hasn't really changed much in the last 10 or 15 years. We're trying to navigate through hundreds and hundreds of channels using that and using these things, which are still incredibly confusing in this day and age of technology. It's really quite astonishing if you think about TV. It really hasn't changed that much. If you want the convenience of time shifting your show and watching it at a time when you'd like to look at it, well, then you get to pay a little bit more for that privilege. You can rent or buy a DVR. In the Hollywood, where I live, every year the TV companies spend about a quarter of a billion dollars to produce anywhere between 120 to 150 new pilots, of which most never actually make it on television. And those that do, well, most of those get canceled. It seems like an inefficient process. And then we turn to the advertisers and we say, well, we want you to pay us, commit millions of dollars up front when we haven't even finished producing all of the shows that we're selling to you, and we still can't tell you who's at home watching them when your ads run. And of course, consumers who say, I want out of this crazy system, I want to watch it on my own terms, on a device of my choosing at a time that I like to watch it, well, those people are considered criminals, and we sue them. So this is the TV system that we have today. It's not really a question, folks, of is television getting disrupted? Well, of course it's being disrupted. The question in my mind is why did it take so long to get out of this crazy system? The entire media industry that we're familiar with, not just, not just media broadcasting, but print, radio, recorded media of all sorts, it's going through a massive change. And it looks like the whole edifice, the whole structure is about to come down and be rebuilt, reconfigured in an entirely new way. We're moving from a world of fixed media to a world of software that can be shared and distributed, bits on a network. We're moving from a world of scheduled entertainment to a world where consumers can demand it at the time of their choosing on the device of their preference. We're moving from a world of one-way broadcasting, one to many, to a world of two-way dialogue. And though this has been possible to incorporate this into television for many years now, it's astonishing to me how few broadcasters take advantage of the opportunity to connect with their audience and incorporate them in the show. We're moving from a world of fixed products, like books, a 500-year-old artifact that we're still very attached to. We're moving into a world of virtual goods, like the prizes that you win in a game like Zynga's game, Cityville. We're moving from a world of search, where you actually have to know how to spell the name of the thing you're looking for, to a world of social discovery where your friends and your extended friends network will help you find new experiences, new exciting things that will amuse you and entertain you. And most importantly, these changes are changing us as the audience. We're shifting from a world where we are passive observers sitting back being programmed to a world where we're active participants. And in the past year, we've seen spectacular evidence of what this can do to an audience. All around the world, people have started to come forth and tell us about the new media tools that they're using. And they're using these tools not just to communicate and connect, but actually to create social change. This process started in 2009 in the streets of Tehran. It spread in 2010 to countries like Korea. 
and more recently we've seen it with the Arab Spring and in the Occupy Wall Street movement, the Occupy movement which occurred in more than 1,000 cities around the world. These people are using social media to organize and advocate for change. So when you give people the power to publish, it's not just content that they're publishing, they're starting to publish express views that galvanize other people and others find validation in that. They discover they're not the only ones who feel that way and you see this huge outpouring that comes out in the streets. It's a whole new era. And these folks are very clear about what tools they're using. They let us know because you'll see it in the graffiti in every part of the world. I was reminded of all this, all this street activity, it reminded me of Antonio Gramsci's statement, an Italian philosopher from the early 20th century. And he was talking about political change and he said the crisis that's happening consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot yet be born. In this moment of interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. That's kind of a heavy thought. But I was thinking about that, I was like, well, that's kind of true for TV, right? We're between one system, one that we're very familiar with, but as I just explained, is filled with kind of crazy paradoxes and, and some strange and hard to explain rules and regulations and business rules. We're moving into an entirely new one, and that's really what I want to talk to you about today. So welcome, folks. Welcome to the interregnum, a strange time where we're going to be moving from one, no, one system that we know well to an entirely unknown, an unknown ecosystem. And let's take a look at some of the morbid symptoms that Gramsci referred to. The first one is denial. Norm mentioned it. Yeah, for years, I've been out there talking to people saying, this change is coming. And often in the audience, there are people who say, absolutely not, it's never going to occur. You've seen this image or you've heard about this myth of the ostrich that buries its head in the sand. But have you seen this image, the business person who does the same thing? I have. It's called the music industry in 2000 and it's called the television indus industry in 2010. Because the change is here. It's happening now. Last year some folks took exception to my comments here about the prospect of cord cutting. Some of the folks in the pay TV industry said there's no evidence of cord cutting. You even hear that today. But the evidence is now in. So analysts in many sectors are starting to report on evidence that people are cutting back on their cable TV and pay TV services. Not large numbers, not huge numbers yet, but what's more important are the intenders. And the intenders, the people who are considering it, the people who are experimenting with online video, well, they comprise double-digit percentages of those current subscriber bases. This is a real thing. In 2012, analysts estimate that 40 million U.S. households will have access to digital video services of one form or another. And of course, if you take the 21 million subscribers to Netflix streaming service and the 28 million households that have HBO and will soon have HBO Go available to them, it's not too difficult to see how we can arrive at a figure that large. That's a significant percentage of the 100 million homes that have uh, TV in the United States. At the same time, the motion picture companies, they still persist in denial as well because they are using artificial scarcity to control the pricing of their goods. They're basically withholding them from this conversation. They're trying to use an age-old tactic of withholding content to extract the maximum payment. I'm not sure that works anymore in an era of, of abundance. There were about 250 motion picture releases last year. And if you look at just the six big studios, it was more like 150 films that were released. But according to the people who do the software for the film, uh, the, the film festivals, they recorded more than 50,000 independent productions were created last year. And of course, there are some 300 million clips on YouTube, and that's a number that no one actually can determine because that number changes every second. That's how fast YouTube is growing. Do release windows still make sense to us in an environment where we have literally hundreds of thousands of choices? This is just what's happening in the United States. 200 TV channels, thousands of video games and magazines. Every year we publish almost 300,000 books. That's about 1,000 books a day that are published in the United States. 500,000 mobile apps and three, 350 million web pages. Does scarcity pricing still make sense when we are awash in a sea of content? The second morbid symptom is that we're using litigation. Our incumbent companies tend to use litigation instead of innovation to compete in this space. More than 100,000 people have been sued by motion picture companies in the past year for file sharing. So they're taking a book, the motion picture companies are taking a page from the book of the record labels. That didn't work so well for the record labels and I can predict with some certainty that it won't work very well for the motion picture companies either to deter this behavior. Last year I spoke to you about a new trend, a thing called a virtual cable operator. This company is called IVTV and they were also sued by the broadcasters for taking their signal and putting it in a digital environment. 
which is something that the cable companies did about 40 or 50 years ago, took the broadcast signal and put it into their own platform, and they also had to go through that phase of litigation. I also mentioned a company called Bamboom. They've rebranded themselves to something called Arrow. And Arrow's a company that's worth paying attention to. What Arrow's done is they know that there's a government rule that says you have to have an antenna in order to get a broadcast signal, so they've created a facility that's got thousands of these little tiny antennas. You can see them on the left side. They're about the size of a penny. Thousands of them. So each individual subscriber can have their own personal antenna. And what that does, it takes a broadcast signal, records it, and makes it available on any digital device at the time of your choosing. This is exactly the scenario the broadcasters do not want to see. And so, of course, we can expect that a lawsuit is imminent. This company will be hit with a lawsuit soon to test whether or not this is legally permissible. Another tactic you'll see incumbent companies use that I consider to be a morbid symptom is that they depend on legislation instead of innovation. Um, one of the new innovative companies that's out there selling digital set-top boxes, side boxes that you can attach, you can buy for about $100 in a retail store, is Boxy. There are many such companies. But Boxy has a neat new innovation. For about $50, you can buy that add-on part. It's a little dongle that'll connect the coaxial cable from the cable company. And that allows you to get the broadcast TV channels in the U.S. clear, free of any kind of encryption. Well, naturally, the cable companies don't like this because it, looked to, it feels to them like their content's being hijacked, the broadcast content's being hijacked. And so they're lobbying right now to change that rule that requires them to send that broadcast signal unencrypted through their cable network. Instead of competing, they're using legislation to stop the innovation. One more morbid symptom, blurring roles or an identity crisis that seems to be endemic. You've heard about TV everywhere. Uh, that's where the, the pay TV companies are starting to take their content, the content that they can get rights to, and put it on other devices off of a set-top box. So here, for example, is Comcast's Xfinity service shown on an Apple iPad. And most of the other pay, pay TV companies in the U.S. have followed suit. And this year, we'll start to see a number of these offerings start to hit the market, uh, where people can kind of watch the programming that they're paying for on pay TV on other devices in the home. And so this is their way of countering the over-the-top over threat from the internet video companies by kind of offering a similar thing on, uh, here on tablets. Uh, but one analyst, one industry analyst, Laura Martin at the Needham Company, she feels that this is actually the beginning of World War III. It hasn't happened yet, but let me share the scenario with you. You see, TV everywhere really means every company in the ecosystem is going to try to launch their own direct-to-consumer offering. Of course, right? So here at the top of the screen, you'll see that cable channels like HBO and movie studios like Sony, here with their offering called Crackle, and broadcast networks in the U.S. like ABC, well, they're all readying or have already got a direct-to-consumer offering. What they're going to discover is that offering competes directly with that from the telcos, like AT&T and Verizon. And it also competes with the offering from the cable operators and satellite operators who have their TV Everywhere initiatives. And that will also crash into offerings from TV manufacturers, companies like Samsung and LG and, of course, Apple. They can't all win, but they will all compete. And what it will certainly do is hasten this new era because it's going to condition the consumer to the expectation that they can get the content of their choice on any device at any time. So in fact, these companies, by competing in this space in this way, will accelerate the very trend that they're trying to stop. One other illustration of this that I think is quite interesting, most companies in the TV business have got an Apple iPad application, and they'll make that available for other tablets. Tablets have become one of the preferred viewing devices in the home. So here you see our broadcast networks. But what's sort of humiliating to them is that they find that their application sits on the exact same shelf space with a number of other companies that they compete with. Offerings from pay TV operators, local TV stations, satellite companies, newcomers like Netflix and Hulu, and then the companies at the bottom of the list, TED, AOL TV, Crackle, TV.com, companies that they didn't even know existed. They didn't even know they were competing with. What's happening, folks, is that TV is turning into an app it's just another app that runs on somebody else's platform. So let's take a look at those platforms, because this is the fifth morbid symptom, platform fragmentation, where each manufacturer seeks to exert some influence over the marketplace by creating proprietary standards that can thereby control the content to some extent. Today, Netflix, the market leader in over-the-top services, is available on 800 devices. It's embedded software. That means that their engineers have taken the effort to code a special version of their client software that runs perfectly, it's optimized for that device. That takes a great deal of effort. If you've ever developed anything for mobile, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
So that means for the consumer, when they buy their device, they don't have to download or install anything. Netflix is already built in. They just turn it on and they get access to the service, which is exactly what consumers want. Anyone that wishes to compete with Netflix will have to do the same. And they're going to have to go to companies, say for this example, Microsoft with their Xbox device, which is a great place to watch over-the-top video. And they'll find that they need to get a proprietary software tool to develop software for it. And as you can see, Microsoft already has a very rich ecosystem of content partners who are developing for that platform. It's a very good device. So is the Sony PlayStation. Increasingly, we're hearing about smart TVs. These two have software, and these two these companies are relying on proprietary software, which means that, again, the content company will have to license a toolkit and develop a special app that works just for that device. But think about it, folks. Did you ever, did you ever want to be in the software porting business? Is that really what our TV companies are here to do? And finally, there's another aspect of content fragmentation. That's where content has different rules on different platforms. So what the consumer expects is to get everything on every device, but that doesn't actually work that way because each content company is applying a different set of rules, a different set of business rules or conditions, licensing terms. And so very frequently what a consumer will do is click on something, a show that they want to watch, and they're confronted with this. A subscription is required to get access to this content. And so when we think about platform fragmentation, we really have to think about it three different ways. There's device fragmentation, that's some proprietary software and a proprietary toolkit that you have to develop specifically for. And again, Netflix has done that 800 times. So if you're developing a direct-to-consumer offering, you'll have to follow suit. Then we have advertising fragmentation. You know, consumers are, are taking this content and watching it on many different platforms. Well, now we need a new set of standards for the measurement of the audience that's using it on those platforms and a new set of rules that allows us to price that audience no matter which platform they're accessing from. We don't have that. There's nowhere, that's nowhere in sight. So we have different rules, different advertising rules, different advertising metrics for each platform. And of course, then there's content fragmentation, which is to say that we have inconsistent rules about what content is made available on which device, and that's incredibly confusing to consumers. For instance, on some services, you'll find that a show that you want to watch may be available 24 hours after it aired on TV. Sometimes it's available 48 hours after it aired on TV. Sometimes it's available eight days after it aired. Sometimes it's not available that season. You can only watch a previous season, and in some cases, they only have a, a few seasons back. They don't even have the second season or two seasons ago. This is incredibly confusing. So consumers actually have to be aware of which content deals have been struck which, with, with which platforms. Ridiculous. Those are the morbid symptoms of an industry in transition. Last year, some of the folks in the audience responded to my comments about innovation and change in a defensive way. They said, well, actually, our companies also do innovation. Well, sure they do. Every company innovates in some fashion or another. Every company has to. If you don't innovate, you're going to be out of business. But there's a big difference between sustaining innovation and disruptive innovation. And this is really the heart of the subject for today. You see, companies that do sustaining innovation, they're really innovating in order to defend a business model. So they'll basically do the minimum amount of innovation to protect the business that they're in. That's very, very different from, from disruptive innovation. One way to think about it is the difference between playing defense and playing offense. The companies that are playing offense, they're not out to do incremental changes to the existing business model. They're there to blow it up completely. These companies are rethinking the entire TV ecosystem. Social media changes everything. You've heard about it. It's been a big story. We've heard about all the spectacular growth in social services. And you may think it's just something for marketing or something for advertising. But there's far more to it than that. This is not just about friends networks. Social media is growing at a spectacular clip. Today, there are about 2 billion people on the planet Earth who access the internet from a landline and a further billion who access it through their mobile device. So let's say that's an audience of about 3 billion. There's some duplication in there. But let's say it's about a third of humanity. 2.1 billion accounts in social networks. 850 million of those are for Facebook. Half of those are people using it via mobile phones. Twitter has 200 million members. Google Plus, which is a service that didn't even exist when I came to visit with you last year, Google Plus already has 90 million members. And though there's a lot of criticism about that service and what it might ultimately evolve into, it's worth noting that it's the fastest growing software application ever in history. And even relatively small companies in this social space, companies like WordPress and Tumblr, have tens of millions of people using their software. And these aren't viewers or readers. These are people who are using the tool to publish 70 million in the case of WordPress, 40 million in the case of Tumblr. And even a brand new service that probably many people haven't heard of, Pinterest, has 11 million members. This is a company that's brand new. It's only a few months old. Social media grows very swiftly. 
That's because it has no boundaries. Its reach is worldwide. One of my projects right now is a project called The Next Billion Seconds. And we're considering what happens in the next 25 years when everyone on the planet Earth has access to the internet. What happens when we're all connected? One thing I can predict with confidence is that we'll all be using social tools. Now, social media differs from broadcast media and traditional media in this way. Because social media can surmount the boundaries that gate traditional media. Most traditional media is bound to a geography, and it's bound to a particular language. And business licensing rules also bind it in certain ways. Social media transcends all of that. And so it can literally grow in linear step with the growth of the internet to reach everybody. This year, we will probably see two companies reach a global audience of a billion, Google and Facebook. It's extraordinary, a billion. Take every number that you know in the television industry and add a zero or two at the end of it, and you start to get a sense of the scale and scope of these businesses. Now, you may be sitting in the audience right now and having a reaction, and it might be positive and it might be negative. I, I wouldn't be surprised if some people were reacting to saying, how does this affect me? There might be confusion. This positive or negative really is a matter of considering, does this present an opportunity or a threat to your business? A lot of people choose to view it as a threat. I view it as a boundless opportunity, but it really is a matter of perspective. Last year, I spoke to you about the architecture of collaboration, the open architecture of the web that enables people to freely share, freely build on open source platforms. And that's one of the reasons why the internet has been this incredible engine of change, driving rapid growth. Opposed to that architecture of cooperation is an old architecture, the architecture of coercion which is all about keeping customers bound up with long-term contracts and giving them penalties for disconnecting from a service and finding ways to extract the maximum amount of revenue out of that ecosystem. And I predicted last year that there would be a collision course between these two things, and sure enough, this year we saw it happen. We saw it happen in this form. Flawed legislation with these names, SOPA, PIPA, ACTA, that's the Stop Online Piracy Act, PIPA was the Protect Intellectual Property Act. A ACTA is the Anti-Counterfeiting uh, Trade Agreement. That's a multi-country agreement. Uh, these bills were being considered. SOPA and PIPA were being considered in the, in the US Congress. And there was a great outcry about these bills when it was revealed that behind closed doors, without much public discussion, and certainly without any technology companies being consulted about them, new rules were being concocted proposed by lobbyists for the media industry that would foist a new set of obligations on the, on the internet business. A new set of obligations that effectively are like this. An old industry saying to a new industry, this is what we're going to do to you. And the implications were quite grave. I do not want to diminish the significance of the issue that's driving this. Piracy is a giant issue for the media company. And tomorrow, Mr. Klein, the other speaker, will tell you in great detail his views on the topic of piracy. So I'm not here to diminish the real issue of piracy in digital media. It's really there. And it's a real concern. And one of the things that drives the media companies crazy is the fact that they need to police this constantly. So they're constantly issuing these takedown notifications to social sites. The social sites duly comply with the takedown notice, but the next day the content pops up somewhere else. It's like a giant version of the whack-a-mole game. No matter where you whack the mole, it's going to pop up someplace else. The media company's been frustrated. They want to push the burden of, of policing this activity over to the social media sites. But in so doing, they proposed rules and regulations that would actually disable the internet, and this is where the issue arose. The matter wasn't helped by the level of invective. The discourse on this subject was confusing because it was so inflammatory. Here you have Twitter, Rupert Murdoch on Twitter, saying that the piracy leader is Google, who streams movies for free, sells adverts around them. No wonder they're pouring millions into lobbying. Now, this statement strikes me as ironic on several levels. First of all, um, for, for Murdoch to accuse anyone else of doing something criminal, when his own company is currently under investigation for a massive scandal involving, involving bribery and corruption of public officials and police departments and illegal wiretapping, it's a bit like the pot calling the kettle black. But even more so for, for, for Rupert Murdoch to complain about Google lobbying. The media companies put $2 million in the coffers of elected officials to, in, in, to garner their support for these bills. So there were plenty of millions poured into this equation by the media companies. 
There were a lot of critics, a lot of people resisted this bill for many reasons. Uh, there were some concerns that it would disrupt the internet, that it might hurt the domain name system, which is really like the address book, the addresses of the internet. They actually felt that the, the cure that was proposed would actually drive most of this illegal activity into some alternative domain name system, which where it'd be more, much more difficult to police. So actually the regulation might backfire. So there were complaints on that level. But perhaps the most important complaint was uh, that from libertarian groups and conservative groups who said actually this is bad news because it's an architecture for censorship. Once you start to create a blacklist of websites that need to be taken down, and once that system, the mechanism for that exists, it's going to be too tempting for politicians of every stripe to start to add more companies to that list, no matter what the moral outrage of the day is. You can imagine politicians saying, well, all right, today the issue is piracy and intellectual property theft. But you know, we have new legislation. We'd like to add a few more things in there. Uh, these are companies that we want to go after for, for violating patents. Here, now we want to come after these companies because they're involved in pornography. Okay, you can start to see, though, that that might start to extend to political speech or religious speech. And this runs antithetical to the principles of the internet, the free flow of information that has made the internet such an innovation engine. It also runs counter to the principles enshrined in the US Congress, I'm sorry, the US Constitution. And that's why so many people spoke out against it. So on January 18th, the internet went on strike. Across the internet, dozens and dozens of websites went black and said, this is what you'll experience if we have to live with this legislation. We won't be able to serve you. We won't be able to offer you social media or the kinds of information services. We won't even be able to link to other sites because that linking was at the core of that, of that proposition. Wikipedia went black. Google blacked out its uh, logo. And at the bottom, you'll see that they asked people to sign their petition, tell Congress, don't censor the web. And the results after 24 hours were quite surprising. 162 million people saw the Wikipedia page, 7 million signatures on the anti-SOPA petition, 2.5 million people tweeted it, and perhaps most important of all, 8 million people used Wikipedia's tool to find the contact info for their congressman or their senator. And as a result, 40 elected representatives in the Congress decided to switch their position and came out in opposition to this bill. Others that were sponsors of the bill withdrew their support within 24 hours. And so we see here the power of social media. The only thing that can stop the growth of this rapidly evolving medium is government regulation. And the only thing that can stop the regulation is social media. It's a standoff. I believe that all media will be social. I've felt that for many years. I've articulated that in many previous talks. Take a look books, a, a business that couldn't possibly be less digital. Books are becoming social through companies like Copia, Subtext, and Goodreads. Magazines are becoming social with software like this. Music is a place of great innovation. All these great new social sharing software services, many of them available through Facebook that allow people to share and discover and talk about the music that they're using. And of course, television is not immune to this. There are a number of companies popping up that have enabled social activity around TV shows. One thing you'll notice about this list of companies is you don't recognize many of those logos. Those are not traditional media companies that are at the forefront of this experimentation. And that causes me to wonder, you know, the greatest tool for advertisers in gathering an audience has been great content, the kind of content that people in this room produce. But if it's so easy to build an audience using social tools around content, then that brings a question up. Is content still king? What is the value of content? when a social software developer can build a tool around that and garner that fan base and start to sell advertising against that fan base. That's a real genuine risk for media companies, for broadcasters in particular. You need to get into this stuff. Distribution is always the first thing to go in the digital media. And we saw an amazing breakthrough just a week ago. Bram Cohen, who created the BitTorrent peer-to-peer -peer file sharing software, came out with a new thing called BitTorrent Live. And it allows companies to use peer-to-peer -peer technology for streaming. And I might point out that this is not the peer-to-peer -peer that we, we consider, you know, that kind of evil peer-to-peer -peer for file sharing. This is using peer-to-peer, -peer, which is by far the most efficient tech, uh, uh, architecture uh, for distributing big, big files, and they're using it for streaming live video. I know a great deal about this because I had to build a platform for streaming live video programming to audiences in the hundreds of thousands, and it's incredibly expensive, and you have to buy huge amounts of bandwidth. This is actually a great breakthrough that will serve media companies as well as startup companies that wish to stream live programs to a huge audience. So this is actually quite powerful, but it does weaken the grip of distributors on content. Social discovery is a theme that I've mentioned a few times. Let me get a little more deep into that because I think it's very important. This is how people are going to be talking about content and finding it in the future. We all know about the social graph. You've heard a lot about the social graph. It turns out that we have a lot of friends in common. And through our friends network, 
you're connected to more people, people that you might not even know. It's friends of friends of friends and so forth. And through that chain of friendship, we start to discover new types of content that might be appealing to us. And so we talk about a social graph, but there's also an interest graph. The social graph you're probably familiar with from Facebook. That's your friend network. The interest graph might be better characterized as something you'd see perhaps on Twitter. When you use a hashtag on Twitter, you're telling the network a little bit about what you're interested in. So those are content topics and themes and subjects that we like to talk about. Now these two things aren't split. They're two parts of the same whole. They're two parts of your digital identity. And they're connected by a continuum of communications and connections tools that allow us to influence one another and thereby drive consumption. It's essential for any media company today to be aware of the dynamics of the social graph and the interest graph. You need to be aware of it because this is how your audience is using your content and referring it and talking about it to their friends. What happens when we bring this to advertisers is it allows us to do something radically different than we've done before. You see, most media that depends on advertising sells content as a proxy for audience. So if an advertiser wants to reach men, we'll typically go to them, a big publisher will go to them and say, well, great, we've got a sports section, a finance section, an auto section, and a section on digital gear. And if you buy advertising in those sections, you'll reach men. So that content is a proxy for that audience that they want to reach. What happens today in digital two-way networks is that you can target with precision. So if an advertiser wants to reach males who are 36-year-old interested in kayaking, biking, yoga, and travel to Nepal, you can reach them in real time, no matter what content they're looking at, and insert dynamically an ad that's targeted for that audience and reach them. It's a much more precise ad spend. It's much more effective. The click-through rates, the influence rates, those are much higher when you're able to target the message to pre with precision to an audience that really wants it. Until this point, that hasn't been available on television, but I believe it's coming. Let me talk to you a little bit about the Facebook effect, because there's been so much chatter about Facebook. Facebook is truly staggering. There's a fellow named Ben Elowitz. He's the CEO of a company called Wet Paint, and he's also a blogger who writes very provocative and interesting thoughts. And last year, he posted this chart. And this chart shows you, in the blue, the growth of page views on Facebook. And in red, the rest of the internet, the rest of the web. And page views are go have gone down 9%. This is in the early part of last year. Effectively, Facebook was absorbing activity from around the web. It's like a black hole. People go into Facebook, and they don't come back out. They spend a huge amount of time there. Later this fall, he published this, which actually was even more shocking. The red in this picture is time spent, minutes spent on Facebook. And all the other colors are all the other social networks of significance. And as you can see, Facebook accounts for 95% of the time that we spend on social networks. This is, again, a chart from Ben Elowitz uh, using ComScore data. It's quite astonishing because this activity that's going into this world, it's not viewable by Google. It's not viewable by search engines. It's proprietary to Facebook. There was recent research that came out from Nielsen that said the average person in the United States looks at about 95, pages, 95 websites in a given month, so almost 100 websites. And in that, we'll look at about 2,800, say 3,000 pages of content on the internet. 800 of them happen inside of Facebook. So about a third of what we're looking at on the web is happening inside of Facebook. That's what social discovery is about. Inside the social network is where we're finding and experiencing these new kinds of content. So it's no surprise then that online video companies are rushing to embrace Facebook. They're rushing to find a way to put their wares where the audience already is. Here, for instance, is Hulu, which has enabled a social viewing uh, experience where you can post comments. And then when other people who you're connected to watch that show, they can see your comments in sync with the program. It's a cool idea, right? It's like having a water cooler conversation as you watch the show. Now, Google had to respond to this. And so there was some controversy recently about Google's moves in this arena. Uh, here's a typical Google search. I was looking for information for you about SOPA, so I did that search. This is my search results. That's typical. You, you're familiar with that. But then I logged into Google+, their new social network. And this is how my results page looks. So it's the exact same search. All I did is up at the top, you can see I logged into Google+. And suddenly, all these new things appeared. 90 personal results from my friends. So now these are things that other people who I'm connected to on Google+, had already posted. And on the right side, you could see that they were offering me things that were already active topics, trending topics inside of their social network. And even under some of the search results, you could see, see for instance, Reese Jones shared this you could see that some of my friends, some of the people I'm connected to, had already noted the story. And you know, that actually does make me more interested. I am interested to know what my friends are looking at, right? It's kind of a validation. It makes me more keen to find out what they're doing. This was tremendously controversial. 
Facebook and Twitter immediately objected. And they filed a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission. Because they said, gee, Facebook is now gaming its search results to favor its own social network. Well, of course they are. Google would love to get access to the data that Facebook have and the access, access to the data that Twitter has. They won't give it to them. So Google, in effect, had no choice. They had to launch their own social network in order to start to mine the results and present the results of social discovery. That's how important it's becoming. Let's take a moment now and talk about Google TV. And the comments I'm going to give you are not official Google comments. I haven't spoken to anyone at Google about this. This is my speculation. But I wanted to take you through this. A, a little bit more than a year ago, Google bought a company called Sage TV, a maker of set-top boxes, but it's a little-known company. It was a small team. Really, it was one of those acquisitions where it looked like they were buying the software team. They wanted that expertise internally. But I paid attention to that because I thought that might be useful when they launch Google on television. Then, of course, last year, they bought Motorola. The acquisition's not complete. It's passed uh, regulatory muster in the United States and in uh, Europe, but the Chinese government hasn't yet given its approval. Uh, the Chinese government isn't fond of Google, so who knows how that'll play out. But my expectation is that that will occur. In buying Motorola, Google gets not only one of the biggest makers of Android cell phones, Android-powered cell phones, they also get one of the biggest set-top box manufacturers, one of the two big set-top box manufacturers. So it's quite, quite clear that Google TV will be a part of future offerings from Motorola. But not just Motorola, Google's done a great job of building an ecosystem. Take a look at this, at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, just in January. They announced partnerships with Sony, LG, and Samsung, and Vizio, and, uh, and semiconductor company Marvell, uh, to produce a whole new range of devices powered by Google TV. There's been a lot of discussion about Google TV. The first release wasn't successful, and so the industry kind of relaxed and laughed about it and said, you know, this isn't working, it's not going to happen. And people let down their guard. I think they're missing the point. Google's not stopping. They're in this business. They bought Motorola. And it's not just about hardware. Think about the advertising ecosystem that Google has built. Google owns DoubleClick. If you publish content on the web, it's almost impossible to avoid doing business with DoubleClick. That's how dominant Google is. Some 70% of pay-per-click advertising runs through their system. And recently, Google has made more acquisitions. They've spent about $8 billion buying advertising technologies, including these two companies, a sell-side platform and a demand-side platform for real-time. Google's building expertise in the real-time insertion of advertising. This is a crucial thing that you must understand if you're in the TV business. Google is not going to be dependent solely on pay-per-click advertising. They're moving into display. They've already sold. They now represent some on, something on the order of 15 or 20 percent of display advertising on the web, and they're not going to stop. And they're going to bring real-time, dynamically inserted advertising to television. I'm confident of that. And finally, let's think about the third part of Google's TV strategy, which involves content. You even know all about YouTube. We all look at YouTube, but you might not know about all these other content acquisitions on the left side that uh, Google has done and all of these technology uh, acquisitions that Google has done. These are technologies that involve the distribution of video, the encryption, access control. In other words, Google is building all the components that they need to replicate pay TV over an IP network. That's what's happening. And then last fall, YouTube announced some spectacular information. First of all, this rapid growth. It's a little bit of an ugly chart. Let me explain what this chart is about. This chart shows how much content is being uploaded to YouTube. And as you can see, back in 2007, people were uploading about eight hours of video every minute. And by last year, in 2011, 48 hours, two days worth of video was uploaded every minute to YouTube. Well, in January, they announced that now, 60 hours of video is uploaded every minute, every day to YouTube. In 2011, YouTube had one trillion views of video in January, four billion views of video, four billion individual video clips were played, and now one hour of content is uploaded every second of the day to YouTube. They currently serve half of the video on the internet. And in a single month, more content is uploaded to YouTube than all four broadcast networks have ever aired since they launched broadcasting in the United States. Every single month, that much content is introduced to YouTube. It's extraordinary. Now, a lot of people in the audience might be thinking the way some TV people think, well, yeah, but YouTube, it's a bunch of web junk. It's a bunch of skateboard tricks and people teaching their pet to sing or something like that. Sure, there's a lot of that out there, right? But remember the sheer scale of this and think about the 10% that's really good quality. And if you're not paying attention to it, that 10% has gotten to be extraordinary good. It rivals broadcast television in its quality. 
and YouTube's not done yet. They understand that there's that lingering perception and that concerns them because their owner, Google, is an advertising company. They have to reshape that perception. They have to reshape the perception that YouTube is, is low-end, user-generated content. And so what they've done is they've started to seed the market for real channels, YouTube channels. About 700 were pitched, and YouTube accepted about 100 of those pitches last fall. And we'll start to see those channels come out now. These are new kinds of channels with celebrity talent, famous talent from real production companies, and some new companies that you may not have heard of before. And Google, uh, YouTube uh, uh, offered them some seed money to get started. In some cases, the grants were small, $500,000. In some cases, they were as high as two to $5 million. In other words, Google is taking the same amount of money that we spend on TV pilots, most of which never are seen on television. Google is taking that same amount of money, but every single frame of that video will be monetized on their platform. It's a highly efficient way for them to launch new channels. You'll see this content coming soon. And the content will be coming from channels you may never have heard of. I'm guessing that many people in the room have not paid attention to Vivo, Machinima, Maker Studios, or Shmuru. These are among the top current channels on YouTube, and they're also some of the recipients of this funding as well. You'll see them offering brand new services. And if you think, well, yeah, but what kind of channel is that? What is Machinima? Well, let's take a look. Machinima, look at the numbers at the bottom of the screen. This is a channel that's dedicated to the gamer audience. And they're not bound by any geography. They reach that gamer audience on a worldwide basis. Last year, they served 10 billion videos. In January, 1.3 billion video sessions to 150 million unique viewers. At a time when a very successful TV show in the United States struggles to reach an audience of 15 million, an audience 10% of that size. This company that no one's ever heard of, Machinima, I think they're the best kept secret in Hollywood. They've garnered that gamer audience. It's like an ultra niche audience, but when you take them aggregated on a global scale, it's a very large number. And it turns out there are many advertisers that crave that audience and are willing to spend real money reaching them. And so this is a company that's making millions and millions of dollars on advertising with YouTube video. Final thought, uh, Google Fiber. So Google has been experimenting uh, quietly by building a fiber optic network that will serve video, uh, sorry, that will serve data at one gigabyte per second. It's extraordinarily fast. Uh, they're developing this in Kansas City. It's a test bed, and no one really knows what they're doing. They haven't released a great deal of information about it, but it is going into test. You can imagine that this sends a sh cold chill down the spine of all the telcos and all the cable companies in America. The thought that Google, Google might start to roll out ultra high-speed fiber, and they're not doing that for pages, and they're not doing that for pay-per-click advertising and search. They're clearly building that infrastructure for rich media content. So my belief is that Google is in this game to win. It's worth paying attention to it. The future media landscape is going to be defined by relatively new things. I'd say a new set of value control points. Our current video landscape, our media landscape, typically has been controlled by these value control points. Access to talent, that's what makes the talent agencies so powerful. Access to financing, that's why we need studios and networks. Access to dis distribution is another form of control. And of course, access to marketing dollars so people can find out about your film or your TV show. So these are some of the ways that major companies are able to extract value out of the ecosystem. But these are changing. In a two-way network, these are less effective. In a two-way network, it appears to me that the companies that are going to succeed are those that build a new ecosystem. And the value control points there are tools for content creation. And a platform for the monetization of content, but many different ways to monetize, including monetizing the data about the users in the two-way network. Platforms that enable people to create brand new experiences and tools for discovery, including the social discovery tools that I referred to just a minute ago. Let's see how this might map against some of the companies we're very familiar with. So I created four quadrants, create, discover, monetize, and consume. And this is a useful way for you to think about the companies that you may be doing business with in the future. You might want to make sure that your offering conforms to these four value control points. Take a look at Apple, for instance. They map perfectly to this. Up in the top left, every Apple computer ships with great tools for consumers to create content. And of course, they have a terrific developer program for pro professional content creators. On the right side, in discovery, Apple's weak in social media. They realize that that's why they partnered with Twitter they integrated that into their new operating system, but they do also have a fledgling social network for mu music called Ping and a number of tools for communication. They've already built a kind of messaging platform that's integrated in all their devices. In terms of monetization, Apple rocks. 
first with iTunes and then with the App Store and then with their Game Center. And also they have iAd, which will create unique advertising experiences for the Apple platform. And then on the bottom right, consumption. Well, here Apple is truly world class. They're setting the pace for the entire industry. They continue to deliver devices that amaze and delight audiences. People are willing to pay a premium for these great experiences on the iPad, the Apple TV, and the iPhone. And watch this space. On March 7, Apple will do an announcement. And it's probably going to be an announcement about a new iPad. And immediately following that, you'll hear an announcement about Apple's IT, Apple TV. And so there's some news coming. I don't know quite what that will be. Probably the new uh, Apple TV will do 1080p video, so it'll be designed for those great big screens that we have. Apple's not the only player in this space. I talked about Google. Of course, they also create tools for consumers to create content and tools for developers. They also have a social network for discovery, Google+. That's a fledgling project, but it's coming on strong. Of course, they dominate search. That's another form of discovery. That's one of Google's strengths. If you look at monetization, well, they've got, their, and they've got their Android app store, but that's not really their strength. The powerhouse here is their advertising business, and they're clearly doing everything they can to get into rich media display. And then in terms of consumption, well, they're following a lead from Apple here by building devices powered with the Android operating system, and I mentioned a minute ago the uh, Google TV initiative. So clearly it's a similar template. I don't have time to get into this, but today we could talk about Facebook, Microsoft, and Amazon. All of these companies map to that diagram as well. What you won't see is a lot of traditional media companies that map to that diagram. Tra traditional media companies haven't been focused on a building a vibrant ecosystem where they take care of developers and make sure that the developers are profitable by giving them great tools and ways to monetize their content. Something to think about as you evolve your own business in the future. There's a theme going around the web right now. Is the web dead? And there's a lot of chatter about this uh, notion that the commons, this area, for the last 20 years, it's caused such great growth in the exchange of information. It depended on a few key attributes of the World Wide Web that we've come to take for granted. Open standards, open source software that anyone can freely use to develop a new experience. The idea that all these websites were interoperable. No matter what device or browser you were using, you could see the content, you could access it. The idea that every kind of content was linked so that you could jump from one publisher's content to another with a, with a hyperlink. And the idea that all of this was searchable so that things could be found. We had a common way to define these things and make them findable. Those are attributes that we almost take for granted. And they have been the things that drove the great explosion of information that we've experienced in the last few decades. But now there's speculation in many quarters in Silicon Valley that this era is coming to an end. And we're starting to see people erect fences, start to fence out certain types of data. Uh, for instance, social media. So all the activity that happens inside of Facebook, that's not viewable by a search engine. That can't be spidered by Google's robots. Likewise, video. All the video and all the activity that happens inside of Netflix, that's not going to show up in a search either. That's entirely separate. Even though it runs on the internet and relies on those internet standards, that's kind of like a separate universe that isn't visible to other companies and it doesn't link out. It's a kind of enclosed universe. Also, every single one of those apps that you've downloaded to your Apple, iPad, or your iPhone, those run on top of internet standards as well, but they don't link back out to the web and they're not searchable, they're not findable. So with all the activity that occurs inside of Apple's app world, that's not something that the rest of the World Wide Web knows about. That data is kept proprietary to Apple for their own advantage. And of course, in real time, I spoke to you about Twitter, the information that happens in the real time web where people are chattering about a breaking news event or celebrity gossip and so on, that data too does not show up in open search. And so what we're starting to see is parts of the internet are being fenced off by, media, by the new media companies. So we're moving from a world of openness to a world of closeness that might resemble that old media world that we talked about, but with entirely new gatekeepers. Now I want to end with some thoughts for producers here. My goal today was to share with you this vision of this new ecosystem that's coming. I've done that. I've shared some thoughts with you about that. And some of you may be concerned. Some people think, well, gosh, is that bad news for us? The good news is that we have an era now of platform wars, where the old companies are scrambling to create a digital offering, and a lot of new and exciting companies are springing up. And all of these companies are willing to pay fees or share revenue with content companies. So it's actually a great time to be in the content business, because whenever there's a lot of buyers, prices tend to go up. So that's great. Media companies are going to start to see big dollars roll in. This idea of digital dimes versus analog dollars, that's over. Netflix spent close to $2 billion on content acquisition. That's real money. And all of their competitors, every rival, is going to have to step up to that level of spending. So this is good news. This might start to replace some of the lost DVD revenue. 
we've become accustomed to companies like HBO developing fantastic programming. That's almost like a grand movie, right? But a movie on an epic scale that runs for an entire season, uh, starting with The Sopranos, more recently with great shows like Boardwalk Empire, Game of Thrones, and now most recently with Luck. Well, now what's happening is Netflix is starting to follow that page. They're doing something very similar. They have a show now available called Lily Hammer, which they bought in the competitive auction environment they got the rights to, and they have two new series coming out that, that will be exclusive to their platform. So in a way, they're kind of taking a page from the strategy that HBO did so successfully. They're not the only ones. Amazon, who also offers a streaming video service, has this offer. People don't know about this, but there's an Amazon Studios program where they actually uh, grant money to people who want to make films and to screenwriters as well. I mentioned Meshinima. Uh, here's an individual person. His name is FPS Russia. That's his program. He's a Russian fellow that lives in the U.S. in Georgia, and he likes to blow things up. And he has a show that's incredibly popular. And this show, this individual person is making millions of dollars with advertising, reaching that audience, that audience of young teenage boys. So you, it is possible to make money on YouTube. Uh, Kickstarter, which is a crowdsourced uh, crowdfunding company. This is a, a company where People can post a project that they want to do and solicit donations from people who want to support it, who want to see that project happen. Well, that's quickly become a source for independent filmmakers to raise funding for their films. People say, yeah, that's a movie I'd like to see. I'll give that person some money. And what happened now, this year at Sundance, just a few weeks ago, 10% of the films in the festival were funded by Kickstarter. And I think four of those, I think 17 films made it into the festival that were funded by Kickstarter. I think four of them ended up as finalists. This is really quite interesting. It's a very untraditional source of funding for creators. And then there's this thought as well. Individual creative people now have the opportunity to garner an audience and go direct. So here's Louis C.K., and you may have heard about this. Very interesting thing. He created his own comedy special, the kind of special you'd see typically on HBO. He spent $175,000 of his own money to rent a studio facility and hire a crew, and he shot a comedy special. And then he put it up on a website for $5. No encryption, no rules around the usage. He just said, look, you can download it, you can burn it to a DVD, you can use it, watch it as many times as you like, just please don't torrent it. He, that's how he spoke to people. If you look at his site, it's quite extraordinary. So he spent $175,000. Within four hours, he made that money back. Within four days, he made $500,000. And by the end of the week, he'd made a million dollars on that. One creator reaching into his own pocket to take the risk on the production cost, and he was rewarded with that. Now, Jim Gaffigan's another comedian who's announced he's going to do something similar. So I think we'll start to see a pattern here. We've also seen that in the music industry. Bands like Radiohead offer programs and allowed people to freely download in exchange for a fee. It's not limited to traditional media. Here's Experts Academy. This is a fellow named Brendan Bouchard, and he's leading this new notion of experts who publish directly onto the internet. These are people who are experts in some subject or another. They might be self-help authors or people who have information to share. And these programs, though you're not going to see them show up in anyone's media analysis of the sector because it looks like educational programming or continuing education in some fashion. These companies are making millions of dollars as well. They're all privately held. There's no data on this. But there are a number of experts that I've spoken to who are making a huge fortune. You can't make money selling a self-help book anymore. That self-help book is a loss leader that drives people to your online program where you use video to teach people. And of course, we're also starting to see universities follow suit. MIT has a program called MITx where they're putting up all their content to audiences around the world. You can't get a diploma from MIT, but you can get their point of view. You can actually audit the courses. Stanford did something similar with their AI course. And so we're entering this era where the definition of what a content company is or a content creator is has expanded greatly to cover many other types of companies. And there really are no barriers. And the good news is that there's actually money out there finally, revenue out there finally for you and a number of companies that look for your great programming ideas. And so I welcome you to embrace this new ecosystem. I wish you the best of possible luck. And thank you for your time this morning. It's been a pleasure chatting with you once again.